And Father, once again, we just thank you for the privilege that we have, Lord, to be able to come to this place, to gather together as brothers and sisters in you, and just revel in your grace, Lord, to understand the magnitude of that great love which you have displayed towards mankind, and that you have given us grace, and it's through grace we're saved. And because of our salvation, Lord, now we come together for the purpose of studying your word. And so, Father, I pray that you would teach us and you would guide us through it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Just turn and greet your neighbors. Howdy, neighbors. <coughs> neighbors? Good evening. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 43, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 tonight. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Chapter 43 focuses upon the grace of God. The grace of God, God's unmerited favor. It's because of the great love with which God has for us that he has given us his great grace, and it's that grace that we need to grasp on to. We need to grasp on and understand that I did not come into the kingdom of heaven based upon who I am. I did not come into the kingdom of heaven based upon what I am able to do. And I did not come into the kingdom of heaven, into God's family, based upon anybody else doing anything for me other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in chapter 43, we, well, in the previous chapter, well, if you want to start from the beginning, there was Isaiah, the prophet. He was the court historian. He was somebody who was really religious. He was kind of looking down his nose at everybody. They were deserving of it, and they would deserve God's judgment without a doubt, but turns out Isaiah was no better than they were. We saw in Isaiah chapter 6, it was in the year that King Uzziah died, that he saw God. He saw God, but he also realized that he's a man of unclean lips. And we have to realize that, especially when speaking the hard things to people. The only reason that my lips have been clean is because they have been made pure by the grace of God. And so it was at this point that God prepares Isaiah with words of warning against Judah. This is the southern kingdom. And this court historian he now has the opportunity to speak to kings, to give those words of warning to these kings that the people of the land might be blessed. And one of his main words of warning is, is Assyria is coming. It's that nation that was rolling over other nations, and then finally they got Judah in their eyesight. And they even came into the land, and they consumed quite a few cities. And they came all the way up to the doorstep, as we have seen in our studies of Jerusalem, but then God supernaturally delivered them so that they would know how God is gracious. The last couple of weeks, we looked at chapter 42, and we were introduced to God's servant. It's a future prophecy of the coming of Messiah. We spent quite a few weeks there, and now we come to chapter 43, and a sermon here in this whole chapter, again, we'll be looking at it in pieces, is the glory of God's great grace. Now keep in mind, again, grace and mercy. I've categorized it as mercy keeps us out of hell. Mercy means you're not getting what you deserve. Grace gets us into heaven. Grace is about getting what we don't deserve. And that being the case, I can kind of get a grasp on it in that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, it says, Now abide, or live your life in faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Well, grace is relevant to our lives today in that it is the foundation of our faith, our hope, and His love within our lives. Without His grace, none of those three would be real in our lives. So I can have trust in God for today. That, that speaks of the faith that I have because God's been gracious to me. Because God's been gracious. Again, it's not something that I've earned it's not something that I caused to come into my life through my actions, because if it was that, then I would have to keep it through my abilities. And, well, in the face of God, I do not have that ability. But because God is gracious, I can have faith for today. 
I can trust in God, knowing that he only has the best for me, that he has this day for me, and he has something for me in each and every day. I can have trust in God for my future. It's because of the hope that I have in him, because he is gracious, because he's gracious. Again, I didn't earn my way into heaven, and so I'm not expecting to get into heaven based upon me gathering points or anything else, but it was given to me. It was given to me as a free gift by God. Since it's based upon the grace of God, I look with earnest expectation of coming into the presence of the Lord one day. And I know his love will never fail me, nor will it ever leave me, simply because God is gracious. Nothing, we're told in Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39, nothing can separate us from the love of God. You see, that, just that verse itself, it, it speaks of the magnitude of God's grace. There's nothing, nothing, nothing that can separate you from the love of God. We're talking about for those people who are born-again believers. Without grace, I could not receive or maintain any of these elements in my Christian life. God, God is gracious. God's not graceful. I heard somebody on the radio the other day to say God is graceful. Graceful is what a ballerina is. You know, they're, they're graceful. God is gracious. He is gracious, and as he is gracious, and he so wants to give. He wants us to receive. And as we have, we just experience all the richness of God and who he is. And so we're going to look at what God has given us through his grace. And the first thing that we're going to see is that it removes our fear. Verse 1, But now thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you, I have called you by your name, you are mine. We've got such great promises in the word of God. And God has told us, we've been told through the, the prophet, through the apostle Paul, really, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not called us to a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so we live in fearful days. We live in fearful times. And again, we lose perspective of this, and I'm concerned. It's Sunday night right now, and i got to go back to my job. And Pastor Mike, you don't understand. When I left my job on Friday, this was going on, and I don't know if I'm going to have a job on, on Monday. Well, you know what? Keep your eyes upon the Lord, continue to worship Him, continue to serve Him, and fear not. Now, I'm not just saying fear not and go back to work and we'll see what happens, but just have the, the mindset that I'm always entering into what God has prepared for me. If that's the case, then, then that God, yeah, He hasn't called me to a spirit of fear, but of power. And it speaks of not only the power of the Holy Spirit, but just the totality of God and the power that He has in order to keep me, in order to cause all things to work together for my good. He's not called me to a spirit of fear, but a spirit of love. And again, that speaks of the continuation of the ministry that God has called me to, to truly be a person that, 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 that exemplifies the love of God to those who enter into my life. And then a sound mind. Then a sound mind. And that's what God's Word does. It levels our minds when there's just so much insanity out there, when there's so much craziness going out there. I, I heard our governor, he signed in the minimum wage, and whether, you know, whether, whatever you believe in that or not, but what he said was, I know this makes no financial sense, but it's the right thing to do. It's like, hello? I mean, if you conducted your life like that, I know this doesn't make any financial sense, but this is what I think is the right thing to do. You'll lose your home, you'll lose everything. It, it makes no sense. And it, it, he, he's messing with our minds. And, and then there's the bathroom thing. Now, <laughs> I, it, it's just amazing the way people are thinking these, these days. I mean, I've always been taught for boys to use the boys' bathroom or locker room or whatever, and girls to use the girls. And it's always worked out so well. I've never seen anybody traumatized because of that. And I have a really bad feeling there's going to be people traumatized because of this. Because I know how the human mind thinks, and it's not a good thing. But I thank God. I thank God, and he's given me a sound mind because my mind is stayed upon him. And how has that occurred? It has occurred because my God is gracious. Now, in the Bible, 
we saw this in our study of Galatians, <clears throat> excuse me, there are five ways that God's grace is spoken of. Five ways that God's grace relates to us. First of all, it is the source of salvation. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9, But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Grace, grace, it's not only the source of salvation, it's how we are saved. Romans chapter 3, verse 24 being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Grace, grace is how we receive an office of ministry or a calling in ministry. And you might look at the teachers who are teaching now and just thank you for the sacrifice, but the only way that they're able to serve God in that capacity is by the, the grace of God. Rosemary, when she serves the food after here, that's by the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God that we are able to serve God. And we have to understand that. No matter how menial we may consider the task to be, as we are exercising our giftings within the body of Christ, it's by the grace of God, because there's not a one of us who deserves that. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying of the hands of the elders. Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith amongst all the nations for his name. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, For by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. It's the grace of God that allows us to expend energy within the midst of ministry. Fourthly, Grace is the source of our spiritual gifting, however it is that you have been gifted spiritually. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, if you're unaware of your spiritual giftings, there's some lists there, although they're not exhaustive, but nonetheless, if you're a born-again believer, God has spiritually gifted you somehow. He's gifted you in the capacity to which he has called you. So however it is that God has called you, He's gifted you in that way so that you would be able to serve him. Romans chapter 12, verse 6, Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. So our gifting is a gift from God. And then fifthly, grace, and well, it, it's also positional. Positional, we looked at it a little bit this morning. I didn't mention the grace aspect of it, but it's how we stand underneath the place where the blessings come it's positional well first peter chapter 5 verse 12 i have written to you briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of god in which you stand as i'm being obedient to the lord i stand in the grace of god as i am uh, moving when god says move or if i'm going when god says go i know that i'm in God's will, and I'm standing in the grace of God. Again, it's that place that God will bless me. And so God's grace, God's grace is so far-reaching in all of our lives. And so God's given promises, and we see three great things here in this first verse. Three great things. First, I need to see this promise that I have from God, and the reality that has come through grace is, He created me. In verse 1, and, and now, thus says the Lord God, who created you, O Jacob? Well, obviously he's talking to the Jews, but he's created us as well. And I need to see it on both fronts. First of all, God has chosen to give me life. And that's just kind of an amazing thing. He, he's formed me and he's created me. He formed me in the womb, created me, allowed me to be born kept me for all of those years, and what that tells me is he's got reason and he's got purpose for my life. And the only way that I came into being, it wasn't by my action. You can say, well, it was by your parents' action. No, it's still by the grace of God. Ask somebody who has a problem conceiving. And then, even more than that, well, the word for created here is, is bara. That means to create something from nothing. Well, here, before I was saved, I was, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, I, I was spiritually dead. I was spiritually dead, and he created something spiritual from nothing. And here, and, and in you as well. And that was done by the, by the grace of God. It wasn't done because of who I am. 
It wasn't done because God says, you know what, I really need Mike in the kingdom of God. It was given to me as that free gift. Again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you he made alive when you were dead in trespasses and in sins. Secondly, we're told here that we were redeemed. And now thus says the Lord God who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. This means that you were bought back with a price. And we know that price to be the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You were far off from God at one point. Now you have been brought near. The Lord, the Lord desired you and wanted you and displayed himself to you so that you would come into the kingdom of God. You did not deserve to come into the kingdom of God, but it was the desire of God, it was the will of God, and it was the work of God, all that came about because of the grace of God. And you need to see the magnitude of redemption here. Again, you were headed to destruction, but God paid the price to redeem you, gave something of value to get you back. We were redeemed from, we were redeemed from the penalty of the law, the sinful nature, condemnation, and eternal separation. And maybe tied up in all of that is, is the burden of guilt. The burden of guilt that we carried throughout our lives before we were saved. The burden of guilt as we had to sear or die to our conscience because we were convicted of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Problem is, most of us get pretty good. Most unbelievers get pretty good in, in searing themselves off and in, 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 in putting that, that knowledge of being a sinner, of righteousness, the existence of God, and, and, the, and the judgment that is to come apart from them. But the guilt always is there, and it always nods. But because of the grace of God, You've been set free from that. Look what you were redeemed to. You were redeemed to eternal life. Sanctification, that means you were separated from the rest of the world because you are now God's. Justification, God chooses to look upon you just as if you have never sinned. Forgiveness, that's a supernatural forgiveness. God, through his power and his ability, and think of the magnitude of that, has chosen to forgive, forgiven you. <clears throat> forgive you. Uh, glorification we're going to have that new body we don't know what it's going to be but we are going to have that new body and that new existence in the presence of God and because of the grace of God we have access to God we're going to have access. we're going to be able to boldly come into the throne room of God you will spend eternity in the presence of God and that's just an amazing thing and then thirdly <clears throat> the last part of verse one you were called I have called you by your name, you are mine. This speaks of the personal nature of your salvation. God did not just save a group of people and you happen to be part of it. The day of your salvation, God didn't think, oh, I'm going to save 100 people and I'll save them over there. He looked down upon you. This is about a personal relationship. God desired you, God pursued you, and finally God got you. And it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference. I did a funeral last Friday. I was talking to my wife. I've done more funerals in the first part of this year than I think I have ever done in any whole year. I've done quite a few. And it's as I'm doing the funerals, I'm considering what to say. I think every funeral I did has been for a saved person this year. And as I'm considering what to say, when that person is saved, it just makes all the difference makes all the difference all the difference of what I'm going to say I mean the gospel goes out either way but it makes all the difference in the people that I'm looking at as I'm preaching that sermon as I'm doing that funeral and I'm just thinking as I'm putting together the study and contemplating the funerals and all of this the grace of God the grace of God meets us at that point of death that point when we're at our absolute helpless that God is at his utmost glorious and as he is there and displaying himself in that, I just see how truly gracious that he is. And so at some point, God looked at you, wanted you, and took you unto himself. Luke chapter 12, verse 7 says, But the very hairs on your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than any sparrows. Some of us, that's not such a big deal. Don't have a whole lot of hairs, but... I understand the point that he's trying to make. He knows us thoroughly. He knows the person who you are. He knows the depth of who you are. 
and still he desired to bring you unto himself. See, when I got married, I didn't just say, give me a woman, I want to be married. I wanted to be married to Terry. I saw that person and I wanted that person. I picked somebody up last Friday, not last Friday, but the Friday before from um, a hotel over here. And I didn't just go in the lobby and pick somebody up. It was my uncle I was picking him. I haven't seen him in quite a while. It was him that I wanted. I didn't have lunch, if you didn't notice. Maybe you didn't notice, because Sal and I, we look like twins. But Sal was up here last, uh, last, last Sunday night. I took Sunday night off just with Easter and everything. And that afternoon, I had lunch. Now, I didn't just have lunch with anybody. I had lunch with Henry Williams. Henry Williams is a three-year-old little boy. He's my grandson. He was somebody special. God didn't just save everyone, although everyone who is saved, he did save, but most importantly, he saved you. He looked down upon your plight, and again, because of the great love, and because he is gracious, he has saved you. You need to look at that, you need to dwell upon that, and understand the magnitude of the grace of God. Because if you're honest with yourself, you look in the mirror, you realize you're not that big of a prize. You're not that big of a prize at all. But again, it's not on merit, this is God's unmerited favor. The grace of God that brings us into the kingdom of heaven. So just as surely as we have the promises that we are created, redeemed, and called, we also have the knowledge of his presence. Look at verses 2 and 5. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Down at verse 5, there's that word again, or those words, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. Fear not, for I am with you. When I was growing up, when I was a kid, if dad was with me, there was no fear. If he was by my side, then nothing else really mattered. And now I have God who will never leave me nor forsake me. Notice some realities in our Christian lives here. You're going to pass through the waters. You're going to pass through the waters of trials. But the Lord, the Lord will be with you. You will go through rivers of floods, but you will not be taken under. You will walk through the fire of refinement, but you will not be scorched. All fearful situations without a doubt, but God has allowed them. God has allowed them for purposes. He allows us to go through those things so that we would, instead of fearing, that we would learn to trust. We would learn to trust in him. He takes us to the extreme so that these would become the norm in our everyday lives. And so the person who's concerned today because of what they left Friday and they're going to be entering back into it tomorrow, fear not, trust in God. Trust in God. What if I get fired? God, he'll bring you into the fire. But you, <laughs> I didn't really think about that, but it's kind of a... He'll bring you into the fired, but he will not allow you to be scorched. And it's true. He, he walks through. Though, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He understands that this is just a shadow. And God is with him as he goes through the valley. The psalmist does. And it's the same thing with us. Whatever it is that we're facing, whatever it is that we've been dreading, fear not. You know, every time you have that worry, how many, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many people here worry? I imagine pretty much 10 out of 10. But every time you get that feeling of worry, Use it as a motivation to prayer, and you'll see God start to change things. Because again, there, there's going to be, because we understand our limitations, and so there's going to be those thoughts of worry that enter in. Christian maturity, part of Christian maturity, is causing that worry level to be decreased. But it's always going to be there to a degree. We're still people of the flesh. Every time you feel that feeling going towards worry, use that as a motivation to prayer. And you'll see God start to increase in your life. And you'll see the magnitude of that which you're facing. It's still going to be difficult without a doubt, but you'll see that reducing. Because my God is meeting me in the midst of that. And as I understand he's meeting me in the midst of that, then if God's for you, who can be against you? Again, the answer to a question in the Bible 90% of the time is to the negative. So the implied answer, if God is for you, then nobody can be against you. And so people will come up against you, but they will not be able to stand against you. And it's interesting, Jesus included this when he was given his great commission in Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20. He says, 
Go, therefore. Since all authority has been given to me, he says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And I pointed out the other night, even to the end of the age, that little portion there, that's you. That includes you, because he's speaking of even to the end of the church age. And so that tells me that I am to go make disciples, I am to baptize, I am to teach. But in the midst of all of that, as I'm doing that, as I'm seeking first the kingdom of heaven, he's with me. He's with me, even to the end of the age. If I go, he'll be there. God is in the going. God is not in the staying stagnant. God is always in the going and the moving. I'm not telling you you need to leave here, but it's about just being active in my Christian life. Go, go might be just going into the next room and giving your kids a devotion. Go, go might be going next door, might be going down the street, might be going in the jungles of South America somewhere. I don't know. But wherever it is that God has called us to go, we must go. But if you go... He's there with us, and he gives this promise even to the end of the church age. Next, we see how precious his love is towards us, verses 3 through 4. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. We've been honored. How have we been honored? We've been honored as God's precious people. And, well, we've been honored in the sight of God, but I think the honor that God has placed upon us is displayed by him placing his name upon us. We are God's people, and if you will, we're Christians. Christ has placed his name upon us. A person has no more precious possession than his name. To defame a person's name is to insult them, but to place somebody's name upon them is to honor them. Now, my wife, on the day that we were married, she did honor me by receiving my name, but I also gave her my name, and and really that's the beauty of marriage. It's the two becoming one. And as we did that, we truly have become one throughout the ages, one in the face of our children, because that was one of the major trials that we all have, one as we face society and jobs and so on and so forth, one in the midst of ministry, and again, I'm not speaking in the capacity of pastor, but just simply believer, and one in all things and for all time. Proverbs 10, verse 7 says, The memory of a righteous person is blessed, but the name of the wicked will rot. Well, far be it that I would take the name of God in vain that because God has placed his name upon me, that as he has honored me that way, in turn, I would honor him by conducting my life in a way that glorifies him. To forget that you are a Christian and act that you are a heathen is to give disrespect and to dishonor our God. He has honored us by loving us. It was the most public ways of display that he could possibly do as he hung upon the cross. And as he's done that, and as he continues to move in my life, I want to move in the ministry that he has called me. I want to give back because he's given to me. Now, I can never give back in the magnitude that he has given me, but I want to express his love because he has called me his and placed that name his name, which is above all names, upon me. Secondly, he has honored us by giving for us. Um, Let me back up a little bit. He has honored us by loving us. How has he loved us? It's the greatest display of love that has ever been displayed. We just celebrated it on Resurrection Day. It was really Good Friday, but it was the love upon the cross. That love upon the cross as he gave himself for us as we were so sinners. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. And so anytime you forget about the love of God, anytime you feel sorry for yourself or overwhelmed, just consider the cross. Consider the cross, yet while you were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And as I was dead in my sins and my trespasses, 
the grace of God displayed by the love of God through the cross came to my life, came to my life in such a way that it was undeniable and changed it and altered it. And it did the same thing with you because it's the only way that man gets into the kingdom of heaven. 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, and we have known and believed the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. And then he has honored us by giving for us. Again, verse 4, since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Back then, the men given were those who took their places as slaves in Egypt and those who were expelled from the land. We know that for us, it was not so much men, but a man. It was the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe on him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Again, you have the love of God. The love of God, when it's in the New Testament, is always married to Jesus Christ and his death upon the cross. And since we're talking about grace, you can't leave Christ or the cross out of the equation. So our fear has been removed because of the knowledge of his promises, his presence, his precious love, and verses 5 through 6, his plan. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. <clears throat> I didn't go into a lot of depth this morning, but it's exactly what I was talking about Israel. If you want to see God's pre uh, promises and the fulfillment of God's promises, look at Israel. Understand the promises that he has directed towards you, but those times when you feel like fearing, look at the promises that God has worked out in nation Israel, because this is how God relates to his people. He has not given up on Israel. He has a great love for Israel, and he continues to pursue them. But we see the promises, again, with Israel as this example, we see these promises being played out even today. If you have eyes for Israel, you will be able to maintain your trust and your hope in God. And so there was that glorious joining together of history and his story. I was watching a documentary not too long ago on World War II, and I was just simply reminded, and a lot of the first part of this documentary was Hitler's persecution of the Jews that started in 1933. The war for us didn't start until, what, was it 41 or 40? 41, I think it was. Um, but the the war in Europe started so much earlier and the persecution of the Jews started even earlier than that. And so 1933, the Nazi party comes into existence. Part of the plan for their quest for racial and social purity is the extermination of the Jews. Hitler made a big mistake there. He made a huge mistake there because he who touches Israel touches the apple of his eye. Now. Keep in mind what that means, the apple of your eye. It's not that, oh, I, Israel is so cute, they're just the apple of my eye. The apple of your eye is your pupil. And what he's saying basically is, he who touches Israel is poking me in the eye. And so what has happened was, Hitler was poking, if you will, God in the eye. You look at it from that perspective, it's not going to turn out well. But for a period of time, you can wonder what in the world's going on because from 1933 to 1945, there was over 5 million Jews who were killed, killed in most inhumane way. And you can ask, how, how could God allow this to happen? I mean, if God really has these plans and these promises, now, now you're looking at it from the backside, just think if you were in the midst of it. You were a theologian and you're in the midst of these things, and you know these things are going on, you would wonder, where is God in all of this? Well, I could tell you, if you asked at that time, Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good. You would ask me, what good could possibly come out from this? And I would tell you, I don't know. But the thing that I do know, all things work together for the good that God's got rich promises with Israel, and although we see all of this persecution and everything going on, I can't explain it in detail, but I do know God is good, and I do know 
God is in charge. And all of these things are going to be lending towards the promises that God gave Abraham as he was establishing the Hebrew people. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And I also know that Nazi Germany is poking God in the eye. Well, World War II ends, and we look around at all of the aftermath and the death camps. My uncle, my uncle John, he was uh, part of the first soldiers that were in those death camps. And it's one thing to see it in history books. It's another thing to look at a relative's photo album and see the body parts and you know just all the ugliness that occurred there and just lends towards the reality of what occurred there. And it's almost surreal to see something like that go on. Well, after World War II, because of the magnitude of not only that war, but of World War I, the United Nations is formed. They tried to form, from what I remember, I might be wrong on this, but I believe they tried to form the League of Nations after World War I, but the United States did not become part of that. We were pretty much isolationists. And we wanted to be isolated even from World War II. We've had enough of the European wars, but as you know, we got brought into it. And so it came time to establish the United Nations in October of 1945, right after the end of World War II. Well, there was a lot of guilt and sediment for for Israel because of what had happened there. The world ignored it for a period of time and didn't want to admit it and so on and so forth. And because of that guilt, well, we know it's because of the hand of God, in 1948, May 15th, a miracle occurs. Israel is reestablished. It was established. They were taken away in Babylonian captivity. Then it was reestablished. Then Rome came in, first century, and once again they were scattered to the wind. And then in 1948, 1948, almost 2,000 years later, it comes back into existence. It's an amazing, that's never happened to a country before. And here, God has reestablished Israel, and, and there they are. And if you ever doubt the existence of God or the promises of God, is all you have to do is, is look back. And God is what we see here again in, in verse 6. God's still doing this work. It's going to increase all the way through to the millennial age. But he says, I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And so God continues to collect the Jews back into Israel. And all of these things, even as I'm speaking, they're just, it's an amazing thing that it just really speaks undeniably of the existence of a holy God. Our fear, our fear has been removed because of the knowledge of his promises, his presence, his precious love, his plan, and lastly, his purpose. Verse 7, everyone who is called by my name whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. This is the reason for God's grace. What is the reason for God's grace? If you would look at God's grace and just examine it, study it, go to the scriptures and consider it, consider you, consider me, why would God be gracious whatsoever? You kind of wonder, what's in it for him? Well, I don't know all that's in it for him, but I do know that the Bible tells us that it's for his glory. It's so that God would be glorified. And I don't even really understand how God's glorified through me because in actuality, we, me, we're all nothing. But it means something to God. It means something to him. Your glorifying God, your existence, your salvation, it means something to God. You need to hold it dear within your heart because God holds it dear in his heart. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 through 6, having, be, having, <laughs> having predestined us to adoption as his sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. The idea here is, is so that others would look at you and see God. See what God is able to do. It's why... Israel was reestablished so that we would see the glory of God. It's why Israel was established so that we would see the glory of God. It's why Christ was crucified and grace was given so that the glory of God would be displayed for all creation to see. So, whatever it is that you're entering into this week, 
if you're feeling fearful, meditate upon God's promises. There's a book full of them right here. Understand that his presence in your life, well, he's present in your life. He's there with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Remember the precious love that saved you, that Christ went upon the cross in order for you to have membership in God's family. His plan, he continues to work out a plan. Sometimes there's going to be rough spots. And also his purposes, that whatever it may be, Lord, that I would give you glory in all situations and all circumstances. Fear detracts from that. Trust, trust builds upon that. May we be a people that build upon the things that God has given to us. Father, once again, we thank you that you are a gracious God, that, Lord, you have given us so much more than we could ever give back to you. But, Father, is all you ask is that we would glorify you. It's the absolute least that we can do, and it's that which we'll be doing for all of eternity. And that being the case, I pray that, Lord, we would start practicing even right now. And so, Father, help us to see the magnitude of the situations and circumstances that we face. The trials and troubles that we're entering into in the week, they're real. There's no doubt about that. But, Father, you have overcome these things. And so, Father, I pray that our trust would be in you. Lord, teach us that trust. And, Lord, it's a process that goes on in our life until the day that we die or are raptured. But nonetheless, continue that process of teaching us to be people who truly trust in you, Lord, understanding that your graciousness, Father, is what saved us, and graciousness is what's going to bring us into your presence. You have such great, rich future for us, Lord. I pray that we would embrace that and rejoice in it. So, Lord, we just thank you for this evening. I pray for those who have come out tonight, Lord, that you would go before them, that you would bless them, that you would watch over and keep them, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We all stand, please? This coming week, nobody will be in the office. We're going to a pastor's conference, and so I'll be out of the office from Monday through to Wednesday. I'll be back here on Thursday. Keep me in prayer. I'm just looking forward to going and sitting in studies and to be able to receive from the Lord and have fellowship with other pastors. It should be.